The Beguilement in the Boat Part 2 of The Wreck of the Golden Mary Before I go on to relate what happened after the two boats were under my command, I will stop a little here, for the purpose of adding some pages of writing to the present narrative, without which it would not be, in my humble estimation, complete. I allude to some little record of the means by which, before famine and suffering dulled our ears and silenced our tongues, we shortened the weary hours and helped each other to forget for a while the dangers that encompassed us. The stories to which Captain Ravender has referred, as having been related by the people in his boat, were matched by other stories related by the people in my boat, and in both cases, as I well know, the good effect of our following in this matter the example of Bly and his men, when they were adrift like us was of unspeakable importance in keeping up our spirits, and by consequence in giving us the courage which was necessary, under providence, to the preservation of our lives. I shall therefore ask permission, before proceeding to the account of our deliverance, to reproduce in this place three or four of the most noteworthy of the stories which circulated among us. Some, I give from my remembrance, some which I did not hear, from the remembrance of others. I come from Ashbrook. It was the armourer who spun this yarn. Dear me, how many years back is that? Twenty years ago it must be now, long before I ever thought of going to sea, before I let rambling notions get into my head, when I used to walk up the street singing and thinking of the time when I should come to have a forge of my own. It was a pretty sight to look down Ashbrook, especially on a fine summer's day when the sun was out. Why, I've been told painters would come from miles off, purposely to put it down on paper, and you'd see them at turnings of the road and under trees, working away like bees. And no wonder, for I have seen pictures enough in my day but none to go near that. I've often wished I could handle a brush like some of those people, just enough, you know, to make a little picture of it for myself, to bring about with me and hang up over my hammock. For that matter, I am looking at it this moment, standing, as it might be, at the corner of the road, looking down the slope. There was the old church, just here on the right, with a slanting roof running to the ground almost. You might walk round it for a month and not see a bare stone. The moss grew so thick all over it. It was very pleasant of Sundays, standing by and seeing the village folk trooping out of the porch and hearing the organ music playing away inside. Then going down the hill a little further on, you met queer old-fashioned houses with great shingle roofs. Beyond that again was a puzzling bit of building, like the half of a church window, standing up quite stiff by itself. They used to say there had once been an abbey or nunnery in these parts, full of clergymen and clergywomen, in the old papist times, of course. And there were little bits of it sticking up all over the place. Then more old houses, how the moss did grow to be sure, until you passed by the Joyful Heart Inn, where every traveller pulled up to refresh himself in his nag. Many is the pleasant hour I've spent in the joyful heart, sitting in the cool porch with the ivy hanging down overhead, or by the great fireplace in the sanded kitchen. There was a sort of open place in front of the joyful heart, with a market cross in the middle, and a spring where the young women used to come for water and stand talking there, telling each other the news. The painters used to put them down too, spring and all and I don't wonder at their fancying them. For when I was sitting that way in the porch, looking out at them, the red petticoats and the queer jars and the old cross and the sun going down behind made a kind of picture very pretty to look at. I've seen the same of it many a time in some of those places about the Spanish main, when the foreign women stood round about and carried their jars in the same fashion. Only there was no joyful heart, 
I always missed the joyful heart in such places. Neither was there the great forge just over the way, facing the joyful heart. I must put in a word here about the forge, though I have been a long time coming round to the point. I never saw such a forge as that, never. It must have been another bit of the old abbey, the great gate most likely, for it was nothing but a huge, wide archway. Very handsomely worked, though, and covered with moss like the rest. There was a little stone hutch at the top that looked like a belfry. The bell was gone long ago, of course, but the rings were there, and the stanchions, all soundly made. Good work, as I could have turned out myself. Someone had run up a bit of the building at the back, which kept out the wind and made all snug and there you had as handsome a forge as ever I came across. It was kept by a young man of the name of Wichelow, Will Wichelow, but he had another name besides that, and I think a better one. If you were to go asking through the village for one Will Wichelow, why, you would come back about as wise as you went, unless indeed you chanced upon the minister or the schoolmaster. No, but because he was always seen hard at his work, swinging his hammer with good will, and stepping back at every stroke to get a better sweep, because he laid his whole soul to the business, the Ashbrook folk christened him Ding Dong Will. He was always singing and at his work. Many a nice young woman of the village would have been glad if Ding Dong Will had looked her way, but he never took heed of any of them, or was more than civil and gentle with them. Look ye, he would say, leaning on his great hammer, are they the creatures for handling cold iron or lifting the sledge? No, no. And he would take up his favourite stave of hammer and anvil, hammer and anvil, lads, yo-ho! I was but a youngster at that time, but had a great hankering after the iron business. I would be nothing else, I told my father, who wanted to send me up to London to learn accounts. I was always dropping down there, and would stay half the day, leaning against the arch and watching the forging. Coming along of a night, I used to get quite cheerful when I saw the blaze of the furnace, and the chinking of the iron was the finest music for me I ever heard, finer than the organ tunes even. Sometimes a dusty rider would come galloping in and pull up sharp at the forge. He had cast a shoe on the road, and Ding Dong Will would come out and take the horse's measure. Then the village folk would get standing round in twos and threes, all of them eyeing over the horse and the rider too. Then he would get upon his nag once more, and the little crowd would open, and he ride away harder than he came, Ding Dong Will, with his hammer over his shoulder, looking after him till he got to the turn of the hill. At last, my father came round and gave up making me a clerk. It would never have done, and Ding Dong Will, who had a liking for me, agreed to take me at the forge. I soon got to use the big sledge fairly enough, nothing, of course, to Ding Dong Will, and so we worked away from morning till night, like two jolly millers, there was fine music at the forge when the two of us were at it. Ding Dong Will never went to the joyful heart. He said he had no time to be idle. But I went pretty often. That is, when the day was done and work over, just to have a talk in the cool porch and hear what company was in the house. For Miss Arthur, Mary Arthur, she that used to sit in the parlour and manage the house, was never very standoff to me. But she had a reason of her own for that, as you will see. She was niece to old Joe Fenton, the landlord, who brought her down from London to keep things going. In short, she was as good a mistress there. Folk said she kept her head a little high, but to say truth, I never found her so. She had had her schooling up in London and had learned manners with the best of them, so it was but nature she should be a stroke above the girls of the place. That was why they didn't like her. About her looks. Ah, she was a beauty. Such hair. It went nigh down to her feet. And her eyes. Why, they shot fire like a pair of stars. 
and she had a way of shifting them back and forward and taking your measure at every look that made you feel quite uneasy. All the young fellows were by the ears about her, but she never heeded or encouraged them, unless it might be that she had a leaning to one, and that was to ding-dong Will opposite. No one thought of such a thing, she kept it so close, but she might as well have had a leaning to a lump of cold iron. The way I came to suspect it was this. The old forge, as I said, was just fronting the joyful heart, and every morning, as sure as I came down to work, I used to see her sitting in the bow window, behind the white curtain, working with her needle. There she would be all the morning, for at that time there was nothing doing downstairs, and every now and again she would be taking a sly look over at the forge, where Ding Dong Will was swinging his great sledge and trawling his hammer and anvil, lads, yo-ho! He was well worth looking out at, was Ding Dong Will. I used to tell him, Mary Arthur is making eyes at you yonder. Have a care, Will. And he would laugh loud and say, She may find better sport elsewhere, nor sweethearts for me, lad. Hand the file. Sing hammer and anvil, yo-ho! I never saw so insensible a fellow, never. But her liking slipped out in more ways than that. Whenever I went in, she was always taking notice of me and asking about myself. How was I getting on at the forge? Did I like the business? Did we do much? What kind was he, the other? He with the curious name. Then she would laugh and show her white teeth. At last, one Saturday evening, I was sitting in the porch, looking at the children playing in the road, when I heard a step at the back, and there was Mary Arthur standing behind me. Resting after the week, she said. Yes, and a hard week we've had of it. Nothing doing at the forge now, I suppose, says she. He had gone down to the green with the young fellows to throw the bar. No, says I. We've let the fire out and we'll rest till Monday. She stayed silent for a minute and then... Why does he, Witchelow, I mean, keep shut up that way at home? She was beating her hands impatiently together. What does it all mean? What do you make of it? I stared, you may be sure, she spoke so sharply. Does he never go out and see the world, go to dances or merrymakings? No, said I, never. Well, said she, isn't it odd? How do you account for it? Well... It is odd, I said. And he so young. All this while she was shifting her black eyes in a restless kind of way. You should try, says she, and get him to mix more with the others, for your own sake as well as his. I was going to tell her I was at him morning, noon and night when the bell rang and she tripped off. Ding Dong Will came into the forge that night fairly tired and done up. Beat them as usual, he said, as he flung himself down on the bench. I knew you would, I said. But it was thirsty work, some drink for heaven's sake. There's not a drop of malt in the house, I said. Well, go over and fetch some, said I. Go yourself. I tell you what, there's a nice girl there always talking of you, and if you've anything of a man about you, you'll go over and speak her softly and show her you're not what she takes you for. Now, there's my mind for you, ding-dong Will. Stuff, says he, laughing. Let her mind her own business and leave me to my anvil. I'll not go. Ah, you're afraid, said I. That's it. Afraid, says he, starting up. You know I'm not. You know I'm not. Here, I'll go. And made straight for the door. Stop, he said, turning round. What did she say about taking me for a different sort of man? No matter now, said I. 
when you come back. It should have been a five minutes job, that fetching the malt. But would you believe it? He was close upon an hour about it. I knew well she had not been losing her time. When he came in, I began at once at him. Ah, ah, said I. Didn't I tell you? I knew it. Nonsense, said he with a foolish kind of laugh. It was none of my fault. She kept me there with her talk and I couldn't get away. Oh, poor Ding Dong Will, I said. You had better have stayed away after all. Folly, says he, laughing more foolishly still. You'll see if she gets me there again. Enough about her. There. I saw he was uneasy in his mind, and so gave him no more trouble. But I needn't have been so delicate with him at all, for next day it was quite the other way. He never gave me peace or rest, sounding me and picking out of me what she had said of him. The man was clean gone from that hour. It's always the way with those kind of men. When they are touched, they run off like a bit of melted metal. He got worse every day from that out. He was in and out of the joyful heart half his time, always on some excuse or other, and going lazily to his work, stopping every now and again to have a look at the white curtain over the way. It was a poor thing to see him. It was indeed. I was ashamed of him. At last, he came to do nothing at all, or next to nothing, and the great hammer was laid by in a corner. Well, this went on, it might be for a month, and folks in the village began to talk and wink and say, what would come next, now that Ding Dong Will was caught at last? I tried to keep things going as well as I could, but it was of very little use. The business fell off, and I never will forget the sinking feel I got when the riders began to go straight on through the village, past the old forge, and pull up at a new place, lately opened beyond the church. After all, they only did what was natural, and went where they would be best attended to. By and by, I saw a change coming on Ding Dong Will. A very odd change. With all his foolishness, he had been in great spirits, always laughing, without much meaning, to be sure, but still, as I say, in great spirits. But now, I saw that he was turning quite another way, getting quite a downhearted, moping kind of manner I couldn't well make out. He would come in of an evening, very rough and sulky, and sit down before the fire, looking into the coals, and never open his mouth for hours at a time. Then he would get up and walk up and down, stamping and muttering. Nothing very holy, you may be sure. I soon guessed, indeed, I heard as much in the village, that she was drawing off a bit, or else trying her play-acting upon him, for she was full of those kind of tricks. She was a very deep one, that Mary Arthur, and it was a pity she ever came into the place. She had a kind of up-and-down way of treating him, one time being all smiles and pleasantness, and next day like a lump of ice, pretending not to see him when he came in. She made him know his place, rolling her black eyes back and forward in every direction but his. Then he would come home raging and swearing. I often wondered what she could be at, or what was the bottom of it all, and I believe I would never have come at the truth if I didn't happen one day to run up against a handsome-looking gentleman in a fisherman's hat, just at the door of the joyful heart. They told me inside it was young Mr. Temple of Temple Court, some ten miles off, come down to stop there for the fishing. There it was. That was the secret of all. He had been there nigh on a fortnight, had come, mind you, for two or three days fishing, but the sport was so good he really must stay a bit longer. Quite natural, and you may say quite proper. I'm thinking there was better sport going on in the parlour than ever he found in the river. Her head was nigh turned with it all, and I really believe she thought she was going to be the mistress of Temple Court before long, though how a young girl that had come down to London and had seen a bit of life should be so short-seeing is more than I can fancy. 
She took the notion into her head, that was certain, and every soul in the place could see what she was at, except the poor blind creature at the forge. But even he had his eyes opened at last, for people now began to talk and whisper, and hope all was right up at the joyful heart. I heard that the minister had gone once to speak with her, but came out very red and angry. No doubt she had bidden him mind his own concerns and not meddle with her. As to old Joe Fenton's looking after his niece, he might as well have been cut out of a block of wood. One morning, just after breakfast, when he, Ding Dong Will, was sitting at the fire as usual and not speaking a word, he turns round quite sharp upon me and says, What is that young Jack doing all this time? What do you say? I'm sure I can't tell, I said, unless it be fishing. Fishing, said he, stamping down the coals with his great shoe. Like enough, I've never heard much of the fish in these waters. Still, he does go out with a rod, I said. There's nothing else here to amuse him, I suppose, but he goes on Monday. Look me in the face, says he catching me by the wrist. You don't believe that he's come only for that. I can't tell, said I. Unless it is that he likes Mary Arthur's company. She's a nice girl. Ah, said he. I've been thinking so some time back, the false hollow jade. This was at the bottom of all her tricks. But I tell you what, said he, snatching his hammer. Let him look out and not come in my way. I give him warning. With this, he got a bit of iron upon the anvil and beat away at it like a wild man. Then he flung it down into a corner and, taking his hat, walked out with great strides. I ran after him and took him by the arm, for I was in a desperate fright lest he should do something wicked. But he put me back quietly. See? said he. I give you a caution. Don't meddle with me. Mind. I didn't try and stop him then, for he looked savage, but I followed a little behind. He made for the joyful heart, and just as he came under the porch with his head down and never heeding where he was going to, he ran full up against somebody, who, without much more ado, gave him back his own and flung him right against the wall. Now then, young Hercules, said a gay kind of voice. I knew it for Mr. Temple's. Now then, look before you, will you? Keep the passage clear. I thought the other was going to run at him straight, but he stopped himself quickly. Who are you speaking to in that way? said he, with a low kind of growl. Is it your horse, or your dog, or your groom? Which? Are those manners? Now, Bruin, says the young man, no words, let me pass, I'm in a hurry. Who was it taught you? says Ding Dong Will, with the same kind of growl, and not moving an inch. Who taught you to call folk Bruins and Herculeses, eh? I declare, says he, colouring up quite red and trembling all over. I've a mind to give you a lesson myself. I will buy. I think he was going to spring at him this time, but I heard steps on the sanded floor, and there was Mary Arthur standing before us. A fine creature she looked too. She was in a tearing rage, and her eyes had more of the devilish look in them than I had ever seen before. For shame, she said to Will. For shame! What do you come here for with your low brawling ways? Who asks you to come? Who wants you? Take him away, home, anywhere out of this. It was a piteous sight to look at poor Ding Dong Will, staring stupidly at her and breathing hard as if there was a weight on his chest. Mr. Temple, says she, turning to him quite changed and with a gentle smile on her face. Can you forgive me for all this? 
that such a thing should have happened to you in our house, but it shall never occur again, never, never. I could see he took her very easy, for he was looking out at something, and she had to say it twice over before he heard her. Sweet Mary, said he, don't give yourself a moment's uneasiness about me. Let things go as they like, so that you don't put yourself out. Here he gave a kind of yawn and went over to the window. She looked after him, biting her lip hard. Why don't you take him away as I told you? She says at last. What does he want here? I pitied him so much to see him standing there so beaten down that I could not help putting in my word. Well, I must say, Miss Mary, poor Ding Dong Will didn't deserve this from you of all people. Hello, says Mr. Temple coming back. Is this famous Ding Dong Will from over the way? No other, sir, says I. Here, Ding Dong Will, says he, putting out his hand. We mustn't fall out. If I had known it was you, you should have had the passage all to yourself. You're a fine fellow, Will, and I've often admired the way you swung the great hammer. She was biting her lips still harder than before, but said nothing. Stop, said he. I have a great idea. So this is Ding Dong Will. Whisper a minute, Mary. He did whisper something to her, and you never saw what a change it made in her. She turned all scarlet and gave him such a wicked, devilish look. This is some joke said she at last. Not a bit of it, says he, laughing. Not a bit of it. Ah, you see, I know what goes on in the village. I couldn't believe that you mean such a thing, says she, getting white again. Staff, said he, very impatiently. I tell you, I am in earnest. Listen, Ding Dong Will, I must be off to London tomorrow. The ladies there are dying to see me, so go I must. Now I know there has been something on between you two. Don't tell me, I know all about it. So now, friend Ding Dong, show yourself a man of spirit and settle it sharp, and I promise you I'll come down myself to give the bride away and start you both comfortably. It was well for him he was looking the other way, and didn't see the infernal look she gave him out of those eyes of her. I think if there had been a knife convenient, she would have plunged it into him at that minute. But she covered it all with a kind of forced laugh, and said she wasn't quite ready to be disposed of so quickly, and then made some excuse to run upstairs. Mr. Temple then yawned again and went over to the window, and wondered would it be a fine night as he had to dine out. Neither of us spoke to him, for he was an unfeeling fellow with all his generous offers. So we left him there, and I brought back Ding Dong Will to the forge again. About four o'clock that same day, it was almost dark at that hour, when I was coming home from buying something in the village, I thought I saw him crossing over to the joyful heart, and as I passed the porch, I swear I saw the two of them, Mary Arthur and he, talking in the passage. There was no mistake about it, and she talking very eagerly. Presently, she drew him into the parlour and shut the door. What could bring him there now, after the morning's business? Well, I thought, he is a poor-spirited creature after all, a true spaniel. He didn't come in, I suppose, for an hour after that, and then in a wild sort of humour, as if he had been drinking. But what do you think of his denying that he had been near the joyful heart at all, or that he had seen her, denied it flat? And then, when I pressed him on it, and asked if I wasn't to trust my own eyes, he began to show his teeth and get savage. I was only a youngster then, and so had to put up with his humours, but I determined to leave him on the first convenient excuse. Dear, how that man was changed in a short time. On this night, he took a fancy that we should go to bed early. He was tired, he said, 
and wanted rest after the day's trouble, and his heart was heavy. So I gave in to him at once, and we were soon snug in our little cots on each side of the hearth. We used to sleep of nights in a queer kind of place, just off the forge, all vaulted over, with arches crossing one another and meeting in a kind of carved bunch in the middle. This might have been the clergyman's pantry, or wine vaults, maybe, in the old times. Whatever use they had for it, it was a very snug place. I recollect there were all sorts of queer faces with horns and hoods, all carved out in the bunch, and I often lay awake at nights looking at them and studying them, and thinking why they were grinning and winking at me in that way. I remember one creature that always aimed straight at you with its tail pointed, holding it like a gun. It might have been about nine o'clock, or perhaps half-past eight, when we turned in. I know I heard the old church clock chiming pleasantly as we lay down. After watching the fire flashing up and down, and taking a look at the funny faces in the bunch overhead, I soon went sound asleep. I woke again before the fire was out, and looking towards Will's cot, saw that it was empty. A vague feeling of uneasiness mingled with my surprise at that discovery, and made me jump out of bed in a moment. I reflected for a little, felt more uneasy than ever, huddled on my clothes in a great hurry, and without giving myself a moment's time for any second thoughts, went out to see what had become of Ding Dong Will. He was not in the neighbourhood of the forge, so I followed a steep footpath in the wood behind, which led straight to the water's edge. I walked on a little, observing that the moon was out and the stars shining and the sky of a fine frosty blue, until I came to an old tree that I knew well. I had hardly cast a first careless look at it before I started back all in a fright, for I saw at my feet, stretched out among the leaves, a figure with a fisherman's hat beside it. I knew it to be young Mr. Temple, lying there quite dead, with his face all over blood. I thought I should have sunk down upon the earth with grief and horror, and ran farther along the little pathway as fast as I could to a place where the trees opened a little, full in the moonlight. There I saw Ding Dong Will standing quite still and motionless, with his hammer on his shoulder, and his face covered up in his hand. He stayed a long time that way, without ever stirring, and then began to come up very slowly, weeping, his eyes upon the ground. I felt as if I were fixed to that one spot, and waited till he met me full face to face. What a guilty start he gave. I thought he would have dropped. Oh, Will, Will, what have you been doing? Some terrible thing. I, 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 nothing, he said, staggering about and hiding his face. What have you done with him, Mr. Temple? I said, still holding him. He was trembling all over like a palsied man and fell back against a tree with a deep groan. I saw how it was then. It was as good as written in his face. So I left him there, against the tree, and all the rest of that horrible night I wandered up and down along the roads and lanes, anything sooner than be under the same roof with him. At last, morning came, and as soon as the sun rose, I stole back, and, looking through the window, found that he was gone. I never liked to think of that night, though it is so far back. By noon the next day, the whole town was in a fever, people talking and whispering at corners. He had been missed, but they were on his track, for it was well known that he was away among the hills, hiding. They dragged the river all day, and on that night, the body of young Mr. Temple was found, his head beaten in with a hammer. What end Will Witchelaw came to, it would not be hard to guess. But Mary Arthur, she who drove him onto it, as everybody knew, 
she was let away and went up to London, where she lived to do mischief enough. The old forge was shut up and fell into greater ruin. For many a long day, no one ventured near that part of the river walk after dark. It was the fifth evening, towards twilight, when poor Dick began to sing, in my boat, the surf boat. At first, nobody took any notice of him, and indeed he seemed to be singing more to himself than to anyone else. I had never heard the tune before, neither have I heard it since, but it was beautiful. I don't know how it might sound now, but then, in the twilight, darkness coming down on us fast, and for aught we knew, death in the darkness, its simple words were full of meaning. The song was of a mother and child, talking together of heaven. I saw more than one gaunt face lifted up, and there was a great sob when it was done, as if everybody had held their breath to listen. Says Dick then, That was my cousin Amy's song, Mr. Steadiman. Then it will be a favourite of yours, Dick, I replied, hazarding a guess at the state of the case. Yes, I don't know why I sing it. Perhaps she put it in my mind. Do you believe in those things, Mr. Steadiman? In what things, Dick? I wanted to draw him on to talk of himself, as he had no other story to tell. She's dead, Captain, and it seemed a little while since, as if I heard her voice far away, as it might be in England, singing it again, and when she stopped, I took it up. It must be fancy, you know. It could not really be. Before long, the night fell, and when we could not see each other's faces, except by the faint starlight, it seemed as if poor Dick's heart opened and as if he must tell us who and what he was. Perhaps I ought to say how poor Dick came to be with us at all. About a week before we sailed, there came to Captain Ravender one morning at his inn a man whom he had known intimately when they two were young fellows. Said he, Captain, there's my nephew, poor Dick Tarrant. I want to ship him off to Australia, to California, or anywhere out of the way. He does nothing but get into mischief here and bring disgrace on the family. Where are you bound for next voyage? Captain Ravender replied, California. California is a long way off, said Captain Ravender's friend. It will do as well as any place. He can dig for gold. The fact is, Dick has run through one fortune and now a maiden aunt who considers the credit of the family offers him three hundred pounds to leave England. He consents to go, and the best plan will be to put him under your charge, pay his passage and outfit, and leave the rest of the money in your hands to be given over to him when he lands at the diggings. Captain Ravender agreed to the proposal, and poor Dick, who had been left standing outside the door, was called in and introduced. I came in just at that point and saw him. He was the wreck of what had been a fine-looking young man ten years ago, dragged down now by reckless dissipation to reckless poverty. His clothing was very shabby, his countenance wild and haggard, his shock of brown hair rusty with neglect, not a promising subject to look at. His uncle told him the arrangements he had made with Captain Ravender in which he apparently acquiesced without much caring. North or south, east or west, said he. It was all the same to him. If he had gone out to India, when he had a chance a dozen years before, he should have been a man or a mouse then. That was the only remark he offered, and the thing was settled. But when the time came to sail, poor Dick was not forthcoming. We sent up to his uncle's house to know what was to be done, and by and by down he came with his nephew, who had almost given us the slip. Until we got into blue water, Dick was prisoner rather than passenger. He did not take to his banishment kindly, or see, as his relatives did, that there was a chance before him of redeeming a wasted life, 
and repairing a ruined constitution. He was a very good-humoured, easy-tempered fellow, and a great favourite aboard, and till the time of the wreck, cheerful, except in the evening, when he got to leaning over the ship's side and singing all kinds of sentimental love songs. I had told the men to keep an eye on him, and they did. I was afraid he might, in one of his black moods, try to make away with himself. He was the younger of two brothers, sons of a yeoman or gentleman farmer in Cheshire, both whose parents died when they were quite little things, leaving them, however, for their station, amply provided for. There was two hundred pounds a year for their bringing up till they were eighteen, when the sum was to be doubled, and at one and twenty they were to get five thousand pounds apiece to start them in the world. Old Miss Julian Tarrant took Tom, the elder, and my friend took poor Dick. Dick was a wild lad, idle at his book, hankering after play, but as kind-hearted and handsome a fellow as you could wish to see. Dick was generally better liked than Tom, who was steady as old time. Both brothers were sent to the grammar school of the town near which where they lived, and one of Dick's discursive anecdotes related to the second master there, whom, he asserted, he should have had pleasure in soundly thrashing at that moment, in part payment of the severe punishment he had formerly inflicted on his idle pupil. When Dick was sixteen, that tide in his affairs came, which, had he followed it out to India, would probably have led on to fortune. But Dick had an invincible tie to England. Precocious in everything, he was deeply in love with his cousin, Amy, who was three years older than himself, and very beautiful. And Amy was very fond of him, as of a younger brother, said poor Dick, with a quiver in his voice as he was telling his story. She was the only creature in the whole world that ever really cared whether I lived or died. I worshipped the very ground she walked on. Tom was a clever, shrewd fellow, made for getting on in the world and never minding anybody but himself. Uncle Tarrant was as hard and rigid as a machine, and his wife was worse. There was nobody nice but Amy. She was an angel. When I got into scrapes and spent more money than I ought, she set me right with my uncle, and later, when it was too late for any good and the rest of them treated me like a dog, she never gave me either a cold look or a hard word. Bless her. For the sake of being near his cousin, Dick professed a wish to be a farmer like his cousin and father, which was quite agreeable to the family, and for three years more he stayed in his uncle Tarrant's house, very much beloved by all, though in his bitterness he said not, for his gaiety and light heart were like a charm about him. If there was a fault, he had friends too many, for most of them were of a kind not likely to profit a young man. Coming home one evening, about twilight, from a hunt which he had attended, the poor lad unexpectedly met the crisis of his fate. He told us this with an exactness of detail that made the scene he described like a bit of Dutch painting. I wish I could repeat it to you in his own words, but that is impossible. Still, I will be as exact as possible. In Mr. Tarrant's house, there was a little parlour, especially appropriated to Amy's use. It had a low window with a cushioned seat, from which one long step took you into the garden. In this parlour, Amy had her piano, her bookcase, her workbasket, her mother's picture on the wall, and several of poor Dick's sketches, neatly framed. Dick liked this room better than any other in the house. When the difference betwixt Amy's age and his seemed greater than it did now, it was here he used to come, to be helped with his lessons, and later, when his red-hot youth was secretly wreathing all manner of tender fancies about her, that he used to sit at her feet, reading to her out of some poetry book, or singing while she worked, or perhaps sang too. These pleasant early intimacies had never been discontinued, 
for while Dick's heart was wasting its first passion on his cousin, she was all the while thinking of somebody else. He was a boy to her, in point of age still, and this particular day ended his blissful delusions. Having put his pony in the stable, he made his way at once to Amy's parlour, opening the door softly, for he liked to surprise her. Neither she nor the person with her heard him enter. They were too much occupied with themselves and each other to hear anything. Amy was standing in the window, and beside her, with his arm round her waist, was the straight-haired, pale-featured curate of the parish. It was a clear yellow twilight, and all about Amy's head the luster shone like a glory. Her hands were down-dropped, and the busy fingers were plucking a rose to pieces, petal by petal, and scattering them on the carpet at her feet. She was as blushing herself as the poor rose, and seemed to listen willingly to the pleadings of her lover. Dick noticed the slight quivering of her lips, and the humid glitter of her eyes, when the low-spoken, tremulous words, meant only for one ear, met his and he said he felt as if all the blood in his body were driven violently up to his brain by their sound. The bird in its cage began trilling a loud song as it pecked at a spray of green which the evening wind blew against the wires through the open window, and under cover of its noise, poor Dick stole out, leaving the young lovers alone in the blush of their acknowledged love. He went back to the stable, got his pony out, mounted it, and galloped away like mad to rejoin the companions he had left an hour before for Amy's sake. It was not till after midnight that he came home, and then he was reeling drunk. His uncle Tarrant and Amy had sat up for him, and being quarrelsome in his cups, he insulted the first and would not speak to his cousin. Poor Dick thought to drown his sorrow, and this was the beginning of his downward course. The individual whom Amy had chosen to endow with her love had nothing about him particular to approve, except his profession. All his attributes, moral, mental, and personal, were negative rather than positive. Poor Dick described him only as straight-haired, as if that epithet embodied all his qualities. He thought that Amy did not really love him, but was attracted by some imaginary sanctity and perfection with which her imagination invested him. It was very likely, from what we see every day, we may be sure that many women have loved, not the man himself they have married, but an ideal which he personates very differently indeed to all eyes but theirs. Dick could not, for many days, restrain the expression of his feelings. Coming one day suddenly on Amy in the garden, where she was walking in maiden meditation, he stopped her and made her listen to his story, which he poured out with much exaggeration of epithet and manner. Amy was startled and distressed. She endeavoured in vain to stop his confession by appealing to his common sense of what was right. Dick, you know I am engaged to Henry Lister. You ought not to have spoken. Let me go, said she, for he had grasped her hands tightly in his. I ought not to have spoken, and I love you, oh cousin. You don't know what love is if you say so. Amy, it will out. Amy, if I had come before the straight-haired parson, would you have listened to me then? A vivid blush flew into the girl's face, but she would not say a word of encouragement. On that blush, however, poor Dick, whether rightly or wrongly, contrived to found a renewed hope. Amy kept his avowal to herself, knowing well that its discovery would entail a total separation from her cousin, and she had become so accustomed to his usefulness and gaiety in a house where everybody else was chilly and methodical that she could not readily part with him. I incline to think myself that she did like Dick better than the straight-haired curate for many reasons, 
and Dick himself was persuaded of it. Her indecision had, as may be supposed, a very pernicious effect on his mind and conduct. One day he was in the seventh heaven of hope and contentment, and the next he was the most miserable dog alive. Then he would go and forget his griefs in a convivial bout with his comrades, till at length his uncle Tarrant turned him out of doors. Amy had tried her influence with him in vain. "'You are the cause of it, Amy, and nobody but you,' said Dick passionately. "'If you would give that straight-haired fellow warning, you should never have to complain of me again.' But Amy, though she fretted a great deal, held to her engagement, and Dick went on from bad to worse. It must have been very deplorable to behold the reckless way in which he dissipated his money as soon as he got it into his hands, ruining at once his prospects, his character, and his health. With a temperament that naturally inclined him to self-indulgence, the road to ruin was equally rapid and pleasant. When Amy married Henry Lister, which she did after an engagement of six months, Dick kept no bounds, and he irretrievably offended his family by intruding himself uninvited amongst the guests at the wedding. There was a painful scene in Amy's parlour where he went secretly, as he himself acknowledged, in the wild hope of inducing her to break off the engagement at the eleventh hour. She was dressed ready for church, and her mother was with her. That made no difference. Poor Dick went down on his knees and cried and kissed his cousin's hands and besought her to listen to him. And Amy fainted. She fainted a second time at the altar when Dick forced himself into her presence and forbade the marriage. He was so frantic, so out of himself, that he had to be removed by compulsory measures before the service could go on. Of course, after a scene like this, His uncle's family kept no terms with him. He was forbidden ever to suffer his shadow to darken their door again. And so, the poor, wild, crazed fellow went headlong to destruction. I doubt very much myself whether Amy was worth such a sacrifice, but he thought so. Life, he said, was unendurable without her, and he did not care how soon he ended it. But this was not all. Amy died of consumption within a year of her marriage, and Dick asserted that she had been killed by bad usage. He went down to his uncle's house where she lay and asked to see her. The request was refused, and he forced his way by the window into the room at night, as was afterwards discovered by the disarrangement of the furniture, and stayed there crying over his dead love until dawn. At her funeral, he joined the mourners and showed more grief than any of them. But as the husband was turning away, he walked up to him and shook his clenched fist in his face, crying, You killed her, you straight-haired dog! It was supposed that if he had not been restrained by the bystanders, he might have done him a mischief. His family gave it out that he was mad, Perhaps he was. Dice, drinking and horse racing now soon made an end of poor Dick's five thousand pounds. He lost every shred of self-respect and herded with the lowest of the low. There is no telling how a man's troubles may turn him, love disappointments especially. Poor Dick's turned him into a thorough scamp. He was a disgrace to the family and a misery to himself but there was this good left in him amidst his degrading excesses, the capability of regretting. He never enjoyed his vices or ceased to feel the horrible debasement of them. He was seen at races, prize fights and fairs, in rags and tatters. He was known to have wanted bread. He was suspected of theft and poaching, and his brother Tom rescued him once out of the streets, where he was singing songs disguised as a lame soldier. Tom allowed him a guinea a week, but before he had been in receipt of it a month, 
he made the annuity over to an acquaintance for £10 to take him to Doncaster, and this friend always went with him to receive the money lest he should lose it, so that Dick suffered extremities while he was supposed to be at least fed and clothed by his family. Ten years of reckless debauchery and poignant misery reduced him to the state in which his uncle Tarrant brought him to me. His aunt Julia, who had brought Tom up, offered to give him money if he would go out of the country and never come back again. How he went out of it, I have told already. When he ceased speaking, I said to encourage him, You'll do well yet, Dick, if you keep steady, and we make land or are picked up. What can it be? said Dick, without particularly answering. That brings all these old things over my mind. There's a child's hymn I and Tom used to say at my mother's knee when we were little ones, keeps running through my thoughts. It's the stars, maybe. There was a little window by my bed that I used to watch them at, a window in my room at home in Cheshire, and if I was ever afraid, as boys will be after reading a good ghost story, I would keep on saying it till I fell asleep. That was a good mother of yours, Dick. Could you say that hymn now, do you think? Some of us might like to hear it. It's as clear in my mind that this minute as if my mother was here listening to me, said Dick, and he repeated, Hear my prayer, O Heavenly Father, ere I lay me down to sleep. Bid thy angels, pure and holy, round my bed their vigil keep. My sins are heavy, but thy mercy far outweighs them, every one. Down before thy cross I cast them, trusting in thy help alone. Keep me through this night of peril, underneath its boundless shade. Take me to thy rest, I pray thee, when my pilgrimage is made. None shall measure out thy patience by the span of human thought. None shall bound the tender mercies which thy holy Son has bought. Pardon all my past transgressions. Give me strength for days to come. Guide and guard me with thy blessing till thy angels bid me home. After a while, Dick drew his coat up over his head and lay down to sleep. Well, poor Dick, thought I, it is surely a blessed thing for you that none shall measure out God's patience by the span of human thought, none shall bound the tender mercies which his holy Son has bought. A quiet, middle-aged gentleman passenger in the longboat, who was going to establish a store out there, and had been our supercargo besides, told what follows. She lay off Narden, the good ship Broken Spectre, I mean, far out in the roads, and I often thought, as I looked at her through the haze, what an ancient, ill-favoured hulk it was. I suppose I came down some three or four times that day, being in a lounging, unsatisfied state of mind, and took delight in watching the high, old-fashioned poop as it rocked all day long in that one spot. I likened it to a French roof of the olden time, it was garnished with so many little windows, and over all was the great lantern, which might have served conveniently for the vane or cupola seen upon such structures. For all that, it was not unpicturesque, and would have filled a corner in a van der Velde picture harmoniously enough. She was to sail at three o'clock next morning, and I was to be the solitary cabin passenger. As evening came on, it grew prematurely dark and cloudy, while the waves acquired that dull indigo tint so significant of ugly weather. Raw gusts came sweeping in towards the shore, searching me through and through. I must own to a sinking of the heart, as I took note of these symptoms, for a leaning towards ocean in any of its moods had never been one of my failings, and it augured but poorly for the state of the elements next morning. 
it will have spent itself during the night, I muttered doubtfully, and turned back to the inn to eat dinner with what comfort I might. That place of entertainment stood by itself upon a bleak, sandy hill. From its window I could see, afar off, three lights rising and falling together, just where the high poop and lantern had been performing the same ocean dance in the daytime. I was sitting by the fire, listening ruefully to the wind, when news was brought to me that the captain, Van Steen, had come ashore and was waiting below to see me. I found him walking up and down outside, a short, thick-set man, as it were, built upon the lines of his own vessel. "'Well, Captain, you wish to see me?' I said. "'Look to this, my master,' he said bluntly. "'There's a gale brewing yonder, and wild weather coming. So just see to this. If we're not round the helder head by tomorrow night, we may have to beat round the bay for days and days. So look to it, master, and come aboard while there is time.' I'm ready at any moment, I said, but how do you expect to get round now? The sea is high enough as it is. No matter, the wind may be with us in the morning. We must clear the head before tomorrow night. Why, look you, he added, sinking his voice mysteriously. I wouldn't be off Helder tomorrow night, no, not for a sack of guilders. What do you mean? Why, don't you know? It's Christmas night, Jan Fagel's night, Captain Jan's. Well? He comes to Helder tomorrow night. He is seen in the bay. But we are losing time, master, said he, seizing my arm. Get your things ready. These lads will carry them to the boat. Three figures here advanced out of the shadow and entered with me. I hastily paid the bill and set forward with the captain for the shore, where the boat was waiting. My mails were got on board with all expedition, and we were soon far out upon the waters, making steadily for the three lights. It was not blowing very hard as yet, neither had the waves assumed the shape of what are known as white horses but there was a heavy underground swell and a peculiar swooping motion quite as disagreeable. Suddenly I made out the great lantern just overhead, shining dimly, as it were through a fog. We had glided under the shadow of a dark mass, wherein there were many more dim lights at long intervals, and altogether seemed performing a wild dance to the music of dismal creaking of timbers and rattling of chains. As we came under, a voice hailed us out of the darkness, as it seemed from the region of the lantern, and presently invisible hands cast us ropes, whereby, with infinite pains and labour, I was got on deck. I was then guided down steep ways into the cabin, the best place for me under the circumstances. As soon as the wind changed, the captain said, we would put out to sea. By the light of a dull oil lamp overhead that never for a moment ceased swinging, I tried to make out what my new abode was like. It was of an ancient, massive fashion, with a dark oak panelling all round, rubbed smooth in many places by wear of time and friction. All round were queer little knobs and projections, mounted in brass and silver, just like the butt-ends of pistols, while here and there were snug recesses that reminded me of cannon stalls in a cathedral. The swinging lamp gave but a faint yellow light that scarcely reached beyond the centre of the room, so that the oakwork all round cast little grotesque shadows, which had a very gloomy and depressing effect. There was a sort of oaken shelf at one end, handsomely wrought, no doubt, but a failure as to sleeping capabilities. Into this I introduced myself without delay, and soon fell off into a profound slumber, for I was weary enough. When I awoke again, I found there was a figure standing over me, who said he was Mr. Boder, the mate, 
who wished to know could he serve me in any way. Had we started yet? I asked. Yes, we had started, above an hour now, but she was not making much way. Would I get up? This was Christmas Day. So it was. I had forgotten that. What a place to hold that inspiring festival in. Mr. Boda, who was inclined to be communicative, then added that it was blowing great guns, whereof I had abundant confirmation from my own physical sufferings just then commencing. No, I would not, could not get up, and so for the rest of that day dragged on a miserable existence, many times wishing that the waters would rise and cover me. Late in the evening I fell into a kind of uneasy doze, which was balm of Gilead to the tempest-tossed landsman. When I awoke again, it was night once more. At least there was the dull oil lamp swinging lazily as before. There was the same painful music, the same eternal creaking and straining, as of ship's timbers in agony. What o'clock was it? Where were we now? Better make an effort and go up and see how we were getting on. It was so lonely down here. Come in. Here the door was opened, and Mr. Boda, the mate, presented himself. It was a bad night, Mr. Boda said, a very bad night. He had come to tell me we were off the head at last. He thought I might care to know. I am glad to hear it, I said faintly. It will be something smoother in the open sea. He shook his head. No open sea for us tonight. No, nor tomorrow night, most likely. What is all this mystery? said I, now recollecting the captain's strange allusions at the inn door. What do you mean? It is Jan Fagel's night, said he solemnly. He comes into the bay tonight. An hour more of the wind, and we should have been clear. But we did what we could. A man can do no more than his best. But who is Jan Fagel? You never heard? Never. Tell me about him. Well, said he, I shan't be wanted on deck for some time yet, so I may as well be here and Mr. Boda settled himself in one of the cannon stalls, thus retiring into the shadow, and began the history of Jan Fagel and his vessel. You have never heard of the famous brig Maelstrom, once on a time well known in these roads. No? For you have not been much about here, I dare say, and it is only old sea folk like myself that would care to talk to you of such things. But I can tell you this, there's not a sailor along the coast that hasn't the story, though it's now, let me see, a good hundred years since she made her last cruise. Why, I recollect when I was a boy, the old hull lying on the sands and breaking up with every tide, for she came to that end after all, the famous Maelstrom, Captain Jan Fagel, commander. I have been told there never was such a boat for foul weather, but that was when he was on board of her. He was a terrible man, was Captain Fogel, and would turn wild when a gale got up, and as the wind blew harder, so he grew wilder, until at last it seemed as if he had gone mad altogether. Why, there was one night my father used to tell me of, when there was a great thunderstorm, and the sea was washing over the lighthouses, the most awful night he ever was out in. It was said that when the flashes came, Captain Jan had been seen dancing and skipping upon his deck. Many of his sailors told afterwards how they heard his mad shrieks above the roaring of the wind. Some said he had sold himself to the evil one, which I think myself more than likely, for he cared neither for God nor man. Well, sir, Captain Fogel took first to the smuggling trade, and soon he and his famous brig became known all along the coast, from Hook up to Helder, aye, and beyond that. But he was seen oftenest at the head, as if he had a sort of liking for the place, 
and always came and went in a storm, so that when the zoider was like a boiling cauldron, and the water running over the lighthouse galleries, old sailors would look up in the wind's eye and say, Captain Fogel's running a cargo tonight. At last it came to this, that whenever he was seen off Helder, he was thought to bring a storm with him, and then they would shake their heads and say, Captain Fogel was abroad that night. Soon he grew tired of this work. It was too quiet for him, so he turned rover and ran up the black flag. He still kept up his old fashion of bearing down in a gale, and many a poor disabled craft that was struggling hard to keep herself afloat would see the black hull of the maelstrom coming down upon her in the storm, and so would perish miserably upon the rocks. He was no true sailor, sir, that captain, but a low pirate, and he came to a pirate's end, and this was the way he fell upon his lost crews, just off Helder Head yonder. There was a certain counsellor of the town, who had many times crossed him in his schemes, and had once been near taking him. Fogel hated him like poison, and swore he would have his revenge of him one day. But the counsellor did not fear him, not a bit of him, but even offered a reward to whoever would take or destroy Captain Fogel and his vessel. When the captain came to hear of this, he fell to raving and foaming at the mouth, and then swore a great oath upon his own soul that he would be revenged of the counsellor. And this was the way he went about it. The counsellor had a fair young wife, Madame Elder, whom he had brought out of France some years before, and whom he loved exceedingly, foolishly, some said, for a man of his years. They and their little girl lived together at a place called Lowe, and no family could be happier. Jan Fogel knew the place well, and laid his devilish plans accordingly. So, as usual, on one of his wild, stormy nights, the brig was seen standing into shore, for no good purpose, as everybody guessed. How he and his mad crew got to land was never accounted for, but this is certain. They broke into the house at Lowe and dragged Madame Elda and her child from their beds and forced them down to their boats. The counsellor was away in the city, but Captain Yan knew well enough how he loved his wife and chose this way of torturing him. An old fisherman who lived hard by the shore said that he woke up suddenly in the night and heard their screams, but they were too many for him, or he would have gone out. He was an old man, and it was only natural. They then pulled away for the ship, he standing up and screaming at the waves like a fiend incarnate, as he was. How the poor passengers ever got alive on board was a miracle, for the waves came dashing over the bows of the boat, where they were lying at every stroke. Now it fell out that at this time there was a British frigate cruising about these parts, for Captain Fogel had a short time before this fired into an English vessel. The frigate was, therefore, keeping a sharp lookout for the brig, and had been looking into all the creeks and harbours along the coasts when she was caught in this very storm of Captain Fogel's raising. Just as she was struggling round the head, she came upon the maelstrom, taking on board her boat's crew. Let go all clear, they heard him cry, even above the storm. And then they saw the dark hull swing round and set off along the shore, where it was hard for the frigate to follow. As for Jan Fogel, if ever Satan entered into a man in this life, he must have possessed him that night. They could hear him from the other vessel as he shrieked with delight and swore and bounded along his deck when other men could scarcely keep their feet. Why, sir, one time he was seen on the edge of the taffrail, his eyes looking in the dark like two burning coals. No doubt he would have got away from them after all, for there was no better mariner in those seas, when just as he was coming round a point, they heard a crash 
and down came his topmast upon his deck. The sailors rushed to clear away the wreck. Bring up the woman, he roared through his trumpet. Bring up the woman and child, you sea imps. Though his ship was in danger, he thought of the counselor. Some of them rushed down into the hold and came up in a moment with Madame Elda and the little girl. She was quite scared and sank down upon the deck as if she were insensible. A handsome creature, sir, they said. Even some of those savages felt for her. They heard her saying over and over again to herself, Oh, such a Christmas night, such a Christmas night. He overheard her. Aha, witch! You shall have a merry Christmas, never fear. So should your husband curse him if we had him here. She started up with a scream when she heard him speaking, and then they saw her standing with her long black hair blown back by the wind and her arms out as if she were praying. Where shall thy judgments find this man? Here, witch! Look for me here on a stormy night, any night. Next Christmas, if you like. Hi, lads, get a sail here and send them over the side. Even those ruffians hung back, for it was too awful a night for them to add murder to their other sins. So, with many oaths, Captain Fogel went forward himself to seize the lady. He shall meet me before the judgment seat, said she, still praying. Cant away, sorceress. Come back here of a stormy night, and I'll meet you. I'm not afraid. And he laughed long and loud. Then he flung the wet sail round them, and with his own hands cast them into the sea. The storm came on fiercer than ever, and they thought that the ship's timbers were going to part. But Jan Fagel strode about his deck and gave his orders, and she bore up well before the wind. It seemed that no harm could come to that ship when he was on board of her. As for the frigate, she had long since got away into the open sea. But the lady's words were not to be in vain, for just as he was going one of his mad bounds along the poop, his foot caught in a coil of rope, and he went over with an unearthly scream into the black, swollen sea. All the crew ran to look out after him, but, strange to tell, without so much as thinking of casting him a rope, it seemed as if they had lost their sense for a time, and could only stand there looking into the waves that had swept him off. Just then, the wind went down a little, and they heard a voice high in the mainmast top, as if someone were calling, and these words came to them very clear and distinct. Yo! Yo! Jan Fagel! Yo! Then all the crew at the vessel's side, as if they had caught some of his own devilish spirit, could not keep themselves from giving out in a great wild chorus. Yo, yo, Jan Fagel, yo! Once more the voice came from the mainmast top, calling, Yo, yo, Jan Fagel, yo! And again the crew answered, louder than before, as if they were possessed. He was seen no more after that. The memory of that night never left that wicked crew, and many of them, when dying quietly in their beds long after, started up with that cry as though they were answering a call, and so passed away to their last account. Every year, as sure as Christmas night comes round, Jan Fagel comes into the bay to keep his word with Madame Elda, and any ship that is off the head then must wait and beat about until midnight, when he goes away. But they are wanting me on deck, said Mr. Boda, looking at his watch. I have stayed too long as it is. Mr. Boda hastily departed, leaving me to ponder over his wild legend. Ruminating upon it, and listening to the rushing of the water close to my ear, I fell off again in a sleep, and began to dream, 
and of course dreamed of Captain Jan Fargel. It was a wild and troubled sleep that I had, and I am sure if anyone had been standing near, they would have seen me starting and turning uneasily, as if in grievous trouble. First I thought I was ashore again, in a sheltered haven, safely delivered from all this wretched tossing, and I recollect how inexpressibly delightful the feeling of repose was, after all these weary labours. By and by, I remarked low-roofed old-fashioned houses all about, seemingly of wood, with little galleries running round the windows, and I saw stately burghers walking in dresses centuries old, and ladies with great round frills about their necks, and looking very stiff and majestic, sat and talked to the burghers. They were coming in and out of the queer houses, and some passed quite close to me, saluting me as they did so, very graciously. One thing seemed very strange to me. They had all a curious, dried look about their faces, and a sort of stony cast in their eyes, which I could not make out. Still they came and went, and I looked on and wondered. Suddenly I saw the little Dutch houses and the figures all quivering and getting indistinct, and gradually the picture faded away until it grew slowly into the shape of the cabin where I was now lying. There it was, all before me, with the cannon stalls and the dull swinging lamp, and I myself leaning on one hand in a carved crib, and thinking what a weary voyage this was. How monotonous the rushing sound of the water! Then my dream went on, and it seemed to me that I took note of a cannon stall in the centre, something larger and better fashioned than the others. The deans, most likely, I concluded wisely, when he comes to service. And then, on that hint, as it were, I seemed to travel away over the waters to ancient isles, and tracery and soft ravishing music, and snowy figures seen afar off, duskily, amid clouds of incense. In time, too, all that faded away, and I was back again in the oak cabin, with the sickly yellow light suffusing everything, and a dark, misty figure sitting right opposite. He caused me no surprise or astonishment, and I received him there as a matter of course, as people do in dreams. I had seen figures like him somewhere. In Rembrandt's pictures, was it? Most likely, for there was the large broad hat, and the stiff white collar and tassels, and the dark jerkin, only there was a rusty, mouldering look about his garments that seemed very strange to me. He had an ancient sword, too, on which he leaned his arm, and so sat there motionless, looking on the ground. He sat that way I don't know how long. I, as it seemed to me, studying him intently, when suddenly the rushing sound ceased, and there came a faint cry across the waters, as from afar off. It was the old cry. Yo! Yo! Jan Fargel! Yo! Then I saw the figure raise its head suddenly, and the yellow light fell upon his face. Such a mournful, despairing face, with the same stony gaze I had seen in the others. Again, the fearful cry came, nearer as it seemed, and I saw the figure rise up slowly and walk across the cabin to the door. As he passed me, he turned his dead, lacklustre eyes full upon me, and looked at me for an instant. Never shall I forget that moment. It was as if a horrid weight was pressing on me. I felt such agony that I awoke with a start, and found myself sitting up and trembling all over. But at that instant, whether the dreamy influence had not wholly passed away, or whatever was the reason, I don't know. I can swear that, above the rushing sound of the waves and the whistling of the wind, I heard that ghostly chorus. Yo! Yo! Jan Fargel! Yo! Quite clear and distinct.
an old seaman in the surf boat sang this ballad as his story to a curious sort of tuneful no tune which none of the rest could remember afterwards. I have seen a fiercer tempest, known a louder whirlwind blow. I was wrecked off Red Algiers six and thirty years ago. Young I was, and yet old seamen were not strong or calm as I. While life held such treasures for me, I felt sure I could not die. Life I struggled for and saved it, life alone and nothing more. Bruised, half dead, alone and helpless, I was cast upon the shore. I feared the pitiless rocks of ocean, so the great sea rose and then cast me from her friendly bosom on the pitiless hearts of men. Gaunt and dreary ran the mountains with black gorges up the land, up to where the lonely desert spreads her burning dreary sand. In the gorges of the mountains, on the plain beside the sea, dwelt my stern and cruel masters, the Moors of Barbary. Ten long years I toiled among them, hopeless, as I used to say. Now I know hope burnt within me, fiercer, stronger, day by day. Those dim years of toil and sorrow, like one long dark dream appear, one long day of weary waiting, then each day was like a year. How I cursed the land, my prison, how I cursed the serpent sea, and the demon fate that showered all her curses upon me. I was mad, I think, God pardon words so terrible and wild. This voyage would have been my last one, for I left a wife and child. Never did one tender vision fade away before my sight. Never once, through all my slavery, burning day or dreary night. In my soul it lived and kept me, now I feel from black despair, and my heart was not quite broken while they lived and blessed me there. When at night my task was over, I would hasten to the shore. All was strange and foreign in land, nothing I had known before. Strange looked the bleak mountain passes, strange the red glare and black shade, and the oleanders waving to the sound the fountains made. Then I gazed at the great ocean till she grew a friend again, and because she knew old England, I forgave her all my pain. So the blue still sky above me, with its white clouds fleecy fold, and the glimmering stars, though brighter, looked like home and days of old. And a calm would fall upon me, Worn, perhaps, with work and pain, the wild, hungry longing left me, and I was myself again. Looking at the silver waters, looking up at the far sky, dreams of home and all I left there floated sorrowfully by. A fair face, but pale with sorrow, with blue eyes brimful of tears, and the little red mouth quivering with a smile to hide its fears. Holding out her baby towards me, from the sky she looked on me. So it was that I last saw her, as the ship put out to sea. Sometimes, and a pang would seize me, that the years were floating on, I would strive to paint her, altered, and the little baby gone. She no longer young and girlish, the child standing by her knee, and her face more pale and saddened with the weariness for me. Then I saw, as night grow darker, how she taught my child to pray, holding its small hands together for its father far away. And I felt her sorrow weighing heavier on me than mine own, pitying her blighted springtime 
and her joy so early flown. Till upon my hands, now hardened with the rough, harsh toil of years, bitter drops of anguish falling, woke me from my dream to tears, woke me as a slave, an outcast, leagues from home across the deep. So, though you may call it childish, so I sobbed myself to sleep. Well, the years sped on, my sorrow, calmer and yet stronger grown, was my shield against all suffering, poorer, meaner than her own. So my cruel master's harshness fell upon me all in vain, yet the tale of what we'd suffered echoed back from main to main. You have heard in a far country of a self-devoted band, vowed to rescue Christian captives pining in a foreign land, and these gentle-hearted strangers year by year go forth from Rome, in their hands the hard-earned ransom to restore some exile's home. I was freed, they broke the tidings gently to me, but indeed, hour by hour sped on, I knew not what the words meant, I was freed. Better so, perhaps, while sorrow, more akin to earthly things, only strains the sad heart's fibres. Joy, bright stranger, breaks the strings. Yet at last it rushed upon me, and my heart beat full and fast. What were now my years of waiting? What was all the dreary past? Nothing to the impatient throbbing I must bear across the sea. Nothing to the eternal hours, still between my home and me. How the voyage passed I know not. Strange it was once more to stand with my countrymen around me and to clasp an English hand. But through all my heart was dreaming of the first words I should hear in the gentle voice that echoed, fresh as ever, on my ear. Should I see her start of wonder, and the sudden truth arise, flushing all her face and lightening the dimmed splendor of her eyes? Oh, to watch the fear and doubting stir the silent depths of pain, and the rush of joy then melting into perfect peace again. And the child, but why remember foolish fancies that I thought? Every tree and every hedgerow from the well-known past I brought. I would picture my dear cottage, see the crackling wood fire burn, and the two beside it, seated, watching, waiting my return. So at last we reached the harbour. I remember nothing more, till I stood, my sick heart throbbing, with my hand upon the door. There I paused, I heard her speaking, low, soft, murmuring words she said. Then I first knew the dumb terror I had had, lest she were dead. It was evening in late autumn, and the gusty wind blew chill. Autumn leaves were falling round me, and the red sun lit the hill. Six and twenty years are vanished since then, I am old and grey, but I never told to mortal what I saw until this day. She was seated by the fire. In her arms she held a child, whispering baby words, caressing, and then, looking up, she smiled. Smiled on him who stood beside her. Oh, the bitter truth was told. In her look of trusting fondness, I had seen the look of old. But she rose and turned towards me. Cold and dumb, I waited there. With a shriek of fear and terror, and a white face of despair. He had been an ancient comrade. Not a single word, we said, while we gazed upon each other. He the living, I the dead. I drew nearer, nearer to her and I took her trembling hand, looking on her white face, looking that her heart might understand. 
all the love and all the pity that my lips refused to say. I thank God no thought save sorrow rose in our crushed hearts that day. Bitter tears that desolate moment, bitter, bitter tears we wept. We three broken hearts together, while the baby smiled and slept. Tears alone, no words were spoken, till he, till her husband said, that my boy, I had forgotten the poor child, that he was dead. Then at last I rose, and turning, wrung his hand, but made no sign, and I stooped and kissed her forehead, once more, as if she were mine. Nothing of farewell I uttered, save in broken words to pray that God in his great love would bless her, then in silence passed away. Over the great restless ocean for twenty and six years I roam. All my comrades, old and weary, have gone back to die at home. Home, yes, I shall reach a haven, I too shall reach home and rest. I shall find her waiting for me, with our baby on her breast. While the foregoing story was being told, I had kept my eye fixed upon little Willie Lindsay, a young Scotch boy, one of the two apprentices, who had been recommended to Captain Ravender's care by a friend in Glasgow and very sad it was to see the expression of his face. All the early part of the voyage, he had been a favourite in the ship. The ballads he sang, and the curious old stories he told, made him a popular visitor in the cabin, no less than among the people. Though only entered as apprentice seaman, Captain Ravender had kept him as much about him as he could, and I am bold to say... The lad's affection for Captain Ravender was as sincere as if he had been one of his own blood. Even before the wreck, a change had taken place in his manner. He grew silent and thoughtful. Mrs. Atherfield and Miss Colshaw, who had been very kind to him, observed the alteration and bantered him on the melancholy nature of the songs he sang to them and the sad air with which he went about the duties of the vessel. I asked him if anything had occurred to make him dull, but he put me off with a laugh, and at last told me that he was thinking about his home. For, said he, a certain anniversary was coming soon. And maybe I'll tell you, he added, why the expectation of it makes me so sorrowful. He was a nice, delicate, almost feminine-looking boy of sixteen or seventeen, the son of a small farmer in Ayrshire, as Captain Ravender's Glasgow friend had told him, and as usual with his countrymen, a capital hand at letters and accounts. He had brought with him a few books, chiefly of the wild and supernatural kind, and it seemed as if he had given way to his imagination more than was quite healthy, perhaps, for the other faculties of his mind." but we all set down his delight and belief in ghost stories and such like to the superstition of his country, where the folk seem to make up for being the most matter-of-fact people in Europe in the affairs of this world by being the wildest and most visionary inquirers into the affairs of the next. Willie had been useful to all departments on board. The steward had employed him at his ledger, Captain Ravender at his reckonings, and as to the passengers, they had made quite a friend and companion of the youth. So I watched his looks, as I've said before, and I now beckoned Willie to come to my side, that I might keep him as warm as I could. At first, he either did not perceive my signal, or was too apathetic, or too deep sunk in his own thoughts to act upon it. But the carpenter, who sat next him, seeing my motion, helped him across the boat, and I put my arm round his shoulders. Bear up, Willie, I said. You're young and strong, and with the help of heaven, we shall all live to see our friends again. 
The boy's eye brightened with hope for a moment. Then he shook his head and said, You're very kind to say so, sir, but it cannot be, at least for me. The night was now closing fast in, but there was still light enough to see his face. It was quite calm and wore a sort of smile. Everybody listened to hear what the poor laddie said, and I whispered to him, You promised to tell me why you were depressed by the coming of an anniversary, Willie. When is it? It's tonight, he said with a solemn voice. And oh, how different this is from what it used to be. It's the birthday of my sister, Jean. Come, tell us all about it, I said. Maybe speaking it out openly will ease your mind. Here, rest on my shoulder. Now say on. We all tried to catch his words, and he began. It's two years ago this very day since we had such a merry night of it in my father's house at home. He was a father in a small way, up among the hills above the dune, and had the lands on a good tack, and was thought a richer man than any of his neighbours. There was only Jean and me of the family, and I'm thinking nobody was ever so happy or well cared for as I was at the time I was young, for my mother would let me want for nothing, and took me on her knee and told me long histories of the Bruce and Wallace, and strange adventures with the warlocks, and sang me a burn songs for by reading me the grand old stories out of the Bible about the death of Goliath and the meeting at King Saul and the witch of Endor. Jean was a kind of mother to me too, for she was five years older and spoilt me as much as she could. She was so bonny, it was a pleasure to look at her, and she helped it in the dairy and often milked the cows herself, and in the winter nights, sat by the side of the bleasy fire and turned the reel or span, keeping time with some long ballad about cruel Rankin coming in and killing Lady Margaret, or the ship that sailed away to Norway with Sir Patrick Spence and sank with all the crew. The schoolmaster came up when he was able to give me lessons, and as the road was long and the nights were sometimes dark, it soon grew into the common custom for him to come up o'er the hills on Friday when the school was skilt, and stay till the Monday morning. He was a young man that had been intended for a minister, but the college expenses had been too much, and he had settled down as the parish teacher at Shalloch, and we always called him Domini Blair. All the week through, we looked for the Dominies coming. Jean and I used to go and meet him at the bend of the hill, where he came off from the high road, and he began his lessons to me in botany the moment we turned towards home. I noticed that I required the specimens that grew at the side of the burns that ran down valleys a good way off. But I was very vain of my running, and used to rush down the gully and gather the flower or weed and overtake the two before they had walked on a mile. So you see, sir, it was not long before it was known all over the countryside that Dominie Blair was going to marry my sister, Jean. Everybody thought it a capital match, for Jean had beauty and siller, and Mr. Blair was the cleverest man in the county, and had the promise of the mastership of a school in the East Country with ninety pounds a year. Our house grew happier now than ever, and when Jean's birthday came round, there was a gathering from far and near to do honour to the bonniest and kindest lass in all the parish. The minister himself came up on his pony and drank prosperity to the young folks at the door, and inside at night there was a supper for all the neighbours, and John Chalmers played on the fiddle, and all the rest of us sang songs and danced and skirled like mad. And at last, when Jean's health was drank, with many wishes for her happiness, up she gets and lays her arms round my old mother's neck and bursts out into a great passionate tears. And when she recovered herself, she said she would never be so happy anywhere else and that weal or ill, dead or alive, in the body or in the spirit, 
she would I come back on that night and look in on the hame where she had spent so sunshiny a life. Some of them laughed at the wild affection she showed, and some took it seriously and thought she had tied herself down by o'er solemn a bargain. But in a wee while the mirth and frolicking gaed on as before, and all the company confessed it was the happiest evening they had ever spent in their lives. Do you ken Loch Luart, sir? A wee bit water that stretches across between the Lurloch and the Breelin. Ah, the grand shadows that pass along it when you stand on the north side and look over to the hill. There's a great blackness settled upon the face, as if the sun had died away from the heavens altogether. Till, when he comes round the corner of the mountain, a glorious procession of sunbeams and colours tax its course across the whole length of the water, and all the hillsides give out a kind of glow, and at last the loch seems all on fire, and you can scarcely look at it for the brightness. A small skiff was kept at the side, for it saved the shepherds miles of steep climbing to get from flock to flock, as it cut off two or three miles of the distance between our house and Shalloch. One Friday, soon after the merry meeting at Jean's birthday, she set off as usual to meet Mr. Blair. How far she went, or where she met him, nobody could tell, for nothing was ever seen nor heard of them from that day to this. Only the skiff on Loch Luart was found keel up, and the prints of feet that answered to their sighs were seen on the wet bank. Nothing would persuade my mother for many a day that she wasn't coming back. When she heard a step at the door, she used to flush up with a great redness in her cheek and run to let her in. Then when she saw it was a stranger, she left the door open and came back into the kitchen without saying a word. My father spoke very little, but sometimes he seemed to forget that Jean was taken away and called for her to come to him in a cheery voice, as he used to do. And then, with a sudden shake of his head, he remembered that she was gone and passed away to his work as if his heart was broken. And other things came on to disturb him now, for some bank or railway or something of the kind where he had bought some shares failed with a great crash and he was called on to make up the loss, and he grew careless about everything that happened, and the horses and carts were seized for debt, and all the cows except two were taken away, and the place began to go to rack and ruin. And at last, Jean's birthday came round again. But we never spoke about it the whole day long, though none of the three thought of anything else. My father pretended to be busy in the field, my mother span, never letting the thread out of her hand. And as for me, I wandered about the hills from early morning and only came back when the dark night began. All through the lengthening hours we sat and never spoke, but sometimes my father put a fresh supply of peats upon the fire and stirred it up into a blaze as if it pleased him to see the great sparkles flying up the chimney. At last my mother all of a sudden ceased her spinning and said, Hark, do you not hear somebody outside? And we listened without getting up from our seats. We heard a sound as if somebody was slipping by on tiptoe on the way to the byer. And then we heard a low wailing sound as if the person was trying to restrain some great sorrow. And immediately we heard the same footstep as if it were lost in snow coming up to the house. My mother stood up with her hand stretched out and looked at the window. Outside the pane, where the rose tree is grown so thick it half hides the lower half, we heard a rustling as if somebody was putting aside the leaves. And then, when a sudden flicker of the flame threw its light upon the casement, we saw the faint image of a bonny, pale face, very sad to look on, with long tresses of yellow hair hanging straight down the cheeks as if it was dripping wet, and heard low, plaintive sobs. But nothing that we could understand. My mother ran forward as if to embrace the visitor and cried, 
Jean, Jean, oh, let me speak to you, my bairn. But the flame suddenly died away in the grate, and we saw nothing more. But we all knew now that Jean had been drowned in Loch Luart, and that she minded the promise she had made to come and see the old house upon her birthday. Here, the boy paused in his narrative for a moment, and I felt his breath coming and going very quick, as if his strength was getting rapidly exhausted. Rest a while, Willie, I said, and try, if you can, to sleep. But nothing could restrain him from finishing his tale. Nah, nah, I cannot rest upon your arm, sir. I have work to do, and it maun be done this night. Woe's me. I didna think last year at this time that ever I would be here. He looked round with a shudder at the coiling waves that rose high at the side of the boat and shut out the faint glimmer that still lingered on the horizon line. So Jean was drowned, you see, he continued, and couldn't have put foot inside, for all they can do is to look in and see what's doing at the old fireside through the window. But even this was a comfort to my mother, and as I saw how glad it made her to have this assurance that she wasn't forgotten, I made her the same promise that Jean had done on her birthday, ill or weal, happy or miserable, in the body or in the spirit, I would find my way to the farmhouse and gear some sign that I loved her as I had always done. And now I ken what they're doing as if I was at home. They're sitting sad and lonely in the silent kitchen. My father puts fresh peats upon the grate and watches their flame as it leaps and crackles up the fireplace. And my mother... Ah... Here, he stretched forward as if to see some object before him more distinctly. Ah, she's spinning, spinning, as if to keep herself from thinking, and the tears are running down her face, and I see the cheery fire and the heather bed in the corner and the round table in the middle and the picture of Abraham and Isaac on the wall and my fishing rod hung up upon the mantelpiece and my herding staff and my old blue bonnet. But how cold it is, sir he went on, turning to me. I felt a touch on my shoulder just now that made me creep as if the hand were ice, and I looked up and saw the same face we had noticed last year, and I feel the clammy fingers yet, and they go downward, downward, chilling me all the way till my blood seems frozen, and I cannot speak. Oh, for another look at the fire and the warm, cosy room, and my father's white head, and my poor old mother's een. So saying, he tried to rise, and seemed to be busy putting aside something that interfered with his view. The rose tree, he said, it's thicker than ever, and I can't see clear. At last, he appeared to get near the object he sought, and, after altering his position, as if to gain a perfect sight, he said, I see them all again. Oh, mother, turn your face this way, for you see I've kept my word, and we're both here. Jean's beside me, and very cold, and we dare not come in. He watched for about a minute, still gazing intently, and then with a joyous scream, he exclaimed, She sees me. She sees me. Didn't I you hear her cry? Oh, mother, mother, take me to your arms, for I'm chilled with the salt water, and nothing will make me warm again. I tightened my hold of poor Willie as he spoke, for he gradually lost his power, and at last lay speechless with his head on my shoulder. I concealed from the rest the sad event that occurred in a few minutes and kept the body hidden till the darkest part of the night closely wrapped in my cloak thank you for listening to 
The Beguilement in the Boats, Part 2 of The Wreck of the Golden Mary, consisting of The Armourer's Story by Percy Fitzgerald, Poor Dick's Story by Harriet Parr, The Supercargo Story by Percy Fitzgerald, The Old Seaman's Story by Adelaide Ann Proctor, and The Scotch Boy's Story by the Reverend James White. If you have enjoyed this audiobook, please consider subscribing and leaving a like to help in the making of future audiobooks. And for exclusive bonus audiobooks and to see your name at the end of videos, please consider supporting the channel by becoming a channel member by clicking the button on screen.